Okay, lovely. Well, we'll continue to let people in as they come, but I might just start today's session with an acknowledgement to country. So I'd like to begin in the spirit of reconciliation and acknowledge the lands that we're all on. I'm here today on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Again, I know we're coming from all across Australia, so I'd like to extend that respect to the lands that we're all meeting on. And I'd like to also extend respect to any Indigenous people here today. I think it's important that we acknowledge the continuing connection to land, waters and culture and recognise that the land that we're all on was never ceded, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I think it's important to continue with the theme NAIDOC week only finished on Sunday, but um, it's a theme that we should really embody throughout the year, not just for a week to continue to get up, stand up and show up. So my name is Ellie. I'm the Purpose and Impact Coordinator at the Funding Network. So the Funding Network, for those that don't know about us, we are Australia, Australia's largest crowdfunding organisation, or sorry, collective giving model is the correct term. Um, and we've held 147 live events. That's been online, in person, and a mix of both. And we've raised over $19 million to support grassroots nonprofits and social enterprises. And now I'll hand it over to Luke, the CEO of Whitebox, to introduce himself. Um, yeah, I'm the um, co-founder and CEO of Whitebox Enterprises, and we exist to help nurture and grow the jobs-focused social enterprise sector across Australia. And we're so excited to um, you know, be here today and talk about what a social enterprise is and how we're excited about this panel. Um, I'm really, or this pitch night, I should say, um, I'm just going to say really quickly and uh, that I am just so excited about this particular event. Money like this is just so hard to come by. And I'm so excited. Um, some people might have seen my post this week to say, you know, I remember talking about this Dom about this in the early days is one of the things that we really wanted to have was a good pitch night. We've all turned up to these pitch events where it's like, come and pitch your social enterprise. And the prize is an hour with Luke for lunch. It's like, that's not really a prize. It's like, we need cash to really grow our models, especially as social enterprises, where sometimes equity, accessing things like equity is a little bit harder. And especially now more than ever, where there is so much to do on our planet. So I'm, I'm really excited about um, this specifically. I've been working in social enterprise for 20 years. Um, White Box has been around for about three. And... You know, I think just to pause for a second, how exciting, you know, for the, for the three social enterprises, the pitch, um, there's going to be the opportunity to pitch at the social enterprise world forum. So think about it. It's like there's going to be hopefully, you know, more than a thousand social entrepreneurs and social enterprise practitioners involved. There's going to be um, incredible opportunities with donors and philanthropists and investors there as well. So it's more than just a pitch. You should just come to the Social Enterprise World Forum anyway. Um, but it's the opportunity to be able to really come and get involved um, and pitch to people that are really interested in your story. Absolutely. Thank you, Luke. And yeah, we're so excited about this event. We think it's um, awesome to be held at the World Forum. So that leads me into... Uh, the TFN has run a couple of events in the past focusing on social enterprises, so this will be the third. We think it's really important. Um, social enterprises can apply for other events that we have throughout the year, but we think this is a really important event to really showcase social enterprises and to support them, as Luke said, with what we can uh, crowdfund together. So as Luke mentioned, but I'll just double, um, the event will be held at the Social Enterprise World Forum in Brisbane on the 28th of September. So it will require that the, pre, the three presenters are there in Brisbane. Um, and the Social Enterprise is a two-day hybrid experience, really bringing together, um, it's like the global flagship event. So it's super exciting for Social Enterprise community in Australia that it's in Brisbane and it's great to be a part of it. So through the three organisations selected will pitch to the live audience. The event will also be streamed virtually. So we're really trying to get as many people involved. And then it's up to the audience to decide where they pledge their money to. Um, so we'll now I'll hand it over to Luke. So what we're gonna go through so is- Ellie, just, just there as well. So when you say, so, so there's not like, if you win and you're one of the successful people, there might be like, if you do a really bad pitch, there might be no money on the table, right? 
the pitch was really important. It is really important. So part of our process is that the three finalists go through pitch coaching. So yeah, it's a professional development experience to make sure that there's no flops on the night because yeah, we've done a lot of events and we know that a good pitch, um, the people are there to hear from the social enterprises. So it's very important for sure. So I've done a, I've done this before back in 2016. Um, and some of you here might have heard of Vanguard Laundry. We could only afford two of the three dryers we needed. So I, I, I rocked up not knowing if anyone wanted to give any money for a, like a dryer that would go in a bloody laundry um, to help change people's lives. And um, we raised seventy thousand dollars from the audience that night, which was, you know, really incredible. And got to be careful not to put any numbers on the table. But sometimes you rock up and. There's only, you know, not that much money at all. So it's just nothing's a yeah. given, I think, is the big thing to communicate, isn't it? It is a very big thing. Even us as a team, we never really know what's going to happen on the night. We're constantly surprised. So, yeah, it's very, it's that part of the excitement of the event is that it's different to a granting round where you know what's up. It can, it can go anyway. Um, so I guess just to give you an overview of today, we'll go through, we'll hand over to Luke to talk about what a social enterprise is. Uh, we'll then be going through the selection criteria because it is a bit different to previous TFN events. And then I'll give you some points about what we think makes a good application. And then if we could just hold questions to the end of the session, we have been looking at the questions of you as you've submitted them. So thank you for getting in early and we've tried to incorporate the answers into the session. So if you could just hold off to the end of the session to ask questions, we've left some time um, for that. And if those questions are really organizational specific, if you could just get in touch with me after we I can have a chat, it's more just those sort of general eligibility questions, but we'll, we'll get to them through the chat function at the end of the session. So look, I thought it was just a good place to start. Um, if you could let us know as a social enterprise expert, what is a social enterprise and uh, give us a bit of information there. Thank you, Ellie. And I just want to kick off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today. I'm in Mianjin in Brisbane. Um, you know, and want to acknowledge the Turbul and Jaguar people, the traditional custodians of the land in which we walk. Um, I'm in deep, deep love with social enterprise. And I think, you know, for me, I, I grew up with this desire to be able to do how do we do community work and how do I do business and how do you merge the two? And I think for most people in the room, we've all been in this world where we're trying to run community programs, but isn't getting grant funding really, really, really hard. And so for me, starting my journey, trade through business was a way to be able to not have to go and ask for money for grants. When I go and ask for money, my legs wobble, even still today. Um, and for me, getting trade was just so much easier. When I talk about what a social enterprise is today, I might say things like, you know, an environment focus or something like that. There's all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And on the Social Enterprise World Forum website, if you just Google SEWF social enterprise characteristics, um, and maybe we can put this link on the page, maybe Dom, um, it gives you a really good overview of of the characteristics of a social enterprise. And we talk about characteristics as opposed to what it is because there's so many different shapes and forms and you've got the left and right of that. You know, if you'd met me five years ago, I would have said a social enterprise has to be a DGR1 charity. Um, and now, you know, there's people running wonderful for purpose for profit models and that's okay as well. I think for me, the things that I look for in a social enterprise and I think when we talk about social enterprise, you know, um, we're in a sector context and I have to be very careful about that as well. Thanks, Dom, for putting that up there. Is you've got to be a business that has a defined social, cultural or environmental impact. So you've got to have a focus that's there. I'm doing this to hire kids with a lived experience and mental illness that want to get their first job to the workforce. I'm doing this because I want to fund toilets in... Africa for those people that don't have this. Your business there is not to have necessarily, you know, the number one priority is not for shareholder benefit to make other people wealthy. Your number one focus is for the cultural or environmental or community impact that's there. You know, we want businesses that are dedicated to the good of our community, planet and enterprise. 
you know, we see it's becoming sometimes a little bit trendy and we see a little bit of social cladding and you might see a bank that has all sorts of ads that say, look at what we're doing for the community. No, that is a business that has a community foundation and doing things that every good business should be. And, you know, I think for us here at White Box and across our sector, you know, we hope that we're working towards a place where all businesses are focused by the environmental, are focused by the community value. It might be one of those things, it might be all of those things, but that's our dream about social enterprise. So that's the first thing is that you have to have a defined social, cultural or environmental impact, or sometimes all of those things. You're looking at with social enterprises, it's really, this is a really important one. You will derive the majority of your income from trade, but let's be careful there and hold up for a second. In that first year, 90% of your revenue might be from grants. In your second year, it might be 50%. But ultimately, you know, we would look at that in the sector as that grant is a bit like getting an equity investment per se. So we're looking, we're looking for businesses that you know are getting to their point by year three. Sometimes I'll do it a lot sooner, sometimes I'll do it from day one, but the majority of their income is coming from selling stuff. Now, it might be that you're selling stuff to government. That's okay. It's not coming in a grant. That's okay. So deriving the majority of your income from trade is something that the panel will really be looking at. Um, and, and it's okay if that's happening over a period of time. Then the really big thing here is the good has to outweigh the private benefit, not the other way around. So if you look at the majority of ASX listed companies, the benefit will probably be the shareholder. Not all, sometimes it's, you know, it's built in and ingrained into the fabric. That's what we're looking for. Um, you know, I think I mentioned before that, you know, my, my deep love of this work is really we're running community programs and instead of getting that funding through grants or government continual contributions, we're getting it through selling stuff. What a beautiful crossover. Some of my favorite social enterprises, to give you a bit of an idea, is in Milan, there's a childcare center that runs out of a prison. Um, you know, that's run by, you know, ex-offenders that are looking for work in that field. And you know, the reason I really love that is it's, you know, it's really challenging and it gets a really good community narrative and it's doing some great impact. And there's a whole bunch of complex problems that really seeded that issue. Um, there's a winery um, that's there for, supporting people with a lived experience in Italy, if it's supporting people with a lived experience mental illness to get their first jobs and everything from putting labels on bottles to selling stuff and doing tastings. And there's all sorts of jobs. Many of us here would have heard of who gives a crap toilet paper. You know, a beautiful business model that's a for profit, for purpose model where 50% of all the profits. Um, so it goes back to those people that founded it and investors and 50% goes back towards funding um, funding work in toilets and sanitary in third world developing countries. That's cool. Unilever currently isn't doing a lot of that stuff. And that's the difference between a social enterprise and something like who gives a crap. You know, I, I'm in deep love with projects like APY Arts Centre in Adelaide, who are working with artists in that first to five year period, doing a whole bunch of really cool partnerships around the world with people like the Paspali Hotel in New York, that are giving those artists the opportunity to have 80% of their 80% um, go back to them as opposed to sometimes what you see where it's 50, 60% going back, um, you know, or 40 to 50% go back to the artists, really making sure that it's going back to those communities that matter. So for me, sorry, Ellie, I know I've gone over, that's what a social enterprise is to me. And I know there'll be lots of other questions on the other side at the end. Perfect. Thanks, Luke. So great to see your passion. I don't know if I know anyone as in love with social enterprises as you. So that's great. Thank you for that overview. Um, I just wanted to get into now the kind of nitty gritty of the selection criteria. As I said, it is different to um, a lot of our other TFN events. So I just wanted to touch on a couple of those key points. And I know that was um, kind of what came through the questions as well. So I'll just do it briefly as Luke did um, give a great overview to begin with. But for this event, um, the, the criteria is different because we are just looking for social enterprises. So the first one um, that I want to bring to your attention is the change. So we're looking for grassroots social enterprises and how we define that is having income from grants and donations not exceeding 
1.5 million per, M, per annum or 4.5 million over three years. So to break that down a little bit, um, it basically we are taking the money from grants and donations out of it. So we're just looking at trading activity and the amount that you've made from trading activity can't exceed 1.5 million per annum. But if you have been running for uh, three years or more, we understand that, especially in these sort of times, you would have had ups and downs in terms of your revenue. So we're happy if you want to look at the last three years and average it out. If the average comes below 1.5 million, we're still happy to accept an application for this. Yeah. So that's- I yeah. just want to- I just want to add to that, like we're looking for social enterprises where this money is going to really make a difference. Yeah. So, you know, if the crowd, you know, we need this, let's say 30, 40 grand, and it's going to really change our trajectory. Um, and, but if you're a business that's turning over 10 mil rev, then you have other options. You can go to investors and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, thank you. That's perfect. The next point I want to bring up is around, so as Luke mentioned, uh, social enterprises can be registered charities. You might also be registered with social traders. Neither of these registrations are necessary, um, but they, you know, it, it is good to support. So we're accepting applications from registered charities, from, from businesses that are not registered charities, and also Indigenous corporations. What we will require is a constitution to be uploaded with your application. So this is particularly for those businesses that are not registered charities. We need to see that your constitutional primary purpose is around that social change mission. So that it's not kind of an afterthought that if we do this, then we'll get this. As Luke said at the start, we're really looking for those businesses and organizations where that social mission and that social purpose is at the core of what you do. And so we'll be able to see that through your constitution. Um, the next two points is around what Luke mentioned as the 50%. So we will consider applications from social enterprises that derive a significant proportion. So this is 50% or above of their income from activity, not from grants and donations. So this is again, making sure that um, for this event, we're really focusing on social enterprises. Um, I'll just make pop some on mute. Um, that we're looking at social enterprises. So if you're a registered charity and only really 10% of your um, revenue is coming from a social enterprise arm, then this probably isn't the right event for you. We have other events that are more around those charities. We're really looking for those organizations that are deriving 50% or more of their income from trade. Then on the flip side, the, if you're a business um, that's not a registered charity, we want to see that um, you're returning a, a significant proportion, at least 50% into your social mission. So again, on that flip side, that you're not a business where it's 90%, you know, a business as usual and 10% is just a um, kind of of charity as Luke was mentioning. If you're not a registered charity, we really need to see that 50% or more is uh, going to fulfill that social purpose and mission. And just to note there that if your organization if the um, service you provide is employing people experiencing barriers to employment, then uh, obviously salaries and wages, that goes to it as well. Okay, the last couple of things are around the applications. So I just want to bring to everyone's attention that um, because of TFN's PBI, we are not able to fund programs that are um, that are primarily focused on the environment or animal welfare. If this is part of what you do as an organization, then that's okay, but it can't under where we can't give um, to organizations where that is the primary purpose of your pitch. So if you're looking at doing the application, if, if, if there's an environmental benefit, then that is fantastic, but it can't be the only um, benefit from your, from your project or your pitch. Under our, under our PBI, we won't be able to give to organizations. And leading on from that, we're also not allowed, we also cannot give except applications for advocacy campaigns, religious or political campaigns, crisis appeals, or health research. So just want to put that out there. The other thing to note is that TFN alumni are not eligible to apply. So this is any organization that has pitched with TFN before. We're really trying to share the TFN love around. So Unfortunately, alumni organizations are not eligible. So um, 
The last thing is that projects can be working anywhere in Australia. So your organization doesn't need to be nationwide. You might be working in one community or one state. That's completely fine. Um, and for organizations with international impact, that is also fine, um, but we would need to see some level of impact within Australia as well. Okay, um, I'll quickly touch on, so they're kind of the nitty gritty eligibility. All of this is, um, all of this information and the other eligibility criteria points is accessible on our website. So when you go to apply, please do make sure that you read through the selection criteria and um, just make sure you are eligible for applying. We definitely know that running a grassroots organization, you're probably all very strapped for time. So we definitely don't wanna be wasting any of your time. So please do take the time to read. I've kind of pulled out those five or six things that I thought were good to bring to your attention, but we do have those um, other eligibility in the criteria as well, which is all available online. We thought it would also be a good idea to give some tips around what makes a good application. So as you can imagine, TFN, we receive hundreds of applications um, per year for all for our different events. So I just thought it'd be good to give some insight into what we're really looking for when we look at applications. Um, the first thing is around clarity. So whenever I'm asked to give feedback to organizations that miss out, often it is a case of clarity, not that the project isn't good. If you, when writing the application, assume that we know nothing about your organization um, because we're looking at a whole heap and we really have quite a short turnaround period. So we don't have time to be calling up, asking you to clarify different pieces of information. So I think what happens is often there's a lot of assumed knowledge, um, even in acronyms. I'm constantly trying to work out what each acronym means in applications. So please make sure when you're doing the application, to make sure it's as clear as possible. I know the word counts are challenging at times. We have tried to make them more flexible so that you do have a bit more space, but it's really about getting to, the, um, getting to what you do and making sure if someone had just met your organization for the first time reading this application, it's really clear what, they do, what you do. Um, again, we do look at the supporting material you provide. We do go onto your website if we can, but it really helps us if you're able to just tell us on that application when we're reading it and we can understand it from there. So clarity is definitely a big one. Um, yeah, just to keep it nice and simple. The other thing to mention is to focus on your why. So often in applications, I read a lot of the how and the what, but um, not as often do I see about why it's important. So if we're looking at, you know, lots of applications coming in, we really need to know why what you're doing is important, why those that uh, group of beneficiaries need that support. And also what, um, what makes it different? Why is it innovative and why is it necessary within the space? A big thing I also want to touch on um, is to align your application to a pitching format. So this application isn't like other grants. Um, it's not going to be, the applications aren't going to be looked at in a boardroom of people within the sector that know you know, sector things. As Luke said before, um, our events at TFN, we really are trying to get the whole Australian population involved in giving. Um, and so when you're doing the application, please keep this in mind that we're looking for projects that everyday Australians will understand and will get and will be compelled to give to. So um, we really try not to make our funding too tied. So we can um, fund operations, we can our funding can be quite broad, but when we're looking at applications, we're really, really looking at that project because it's that project that then will turn into a pitch. And if that pitch doesn't connect with the audience, then we just don't raise as much. So when you're doing the application, it's um, please be sure to make uh, the impact of your project really clear so that when we're looking at it, we think, yeah, that would be a good pitch that will um, connect to the hearts, to the minds of the audience members. And, it's, um, and it makes sense to anyone that has just joined in from around Australia who might not have any idea what a social enterprise is. So definitely I can't um, stress that enough that we do read applications sometimes and just think this won't work in a pitch. And it doesn't matter how good your organization is or what, if it doesn't work in a pitch, then we can't really put it, put it forward because that's the whole thing is about crowdfunding and getting everyone involved. So please keep that in mind. The other thing that I touched on is around the project. 
So be really clear around what the project is. In the application, we've asked you to submit a project for 40,000 plus. So it's really important that you think about this and that the budget breakdown is really clear. This is um, what we use to decide. And then when we go through the selection process, it's really focusing on, um, as Luke kind of mentioned before, what, what would you be able to make possible? If you were given $40,000, what could you do? And it's really that inspiring sort of story behind it. So if you're going to do, yeah, in the budget breakdown, please um, submit a project that is 40,000. If you want to put in, uh, you know, if we've got more, this is like what the capacity of what else you could do, but definitely at least that 40,000 and to make it quite clear in the budget breakdown so that we really know what we're funding. And then, yeah, if you want to go, you know, with, the, with every extra thousand or with every extra 10,000 would be able to do this. That's also great to see the sort of capacity you have to take on more funding. Because as Luke said, we never really know what we're gonna raise on the night. So please um, make sure in that project, $40,000, clear budget breakdown, clear project outcomes. And also we ask about the impact. Um, that's really important to donors is the impact as you would all know, we're constantly even at TFN, we're now looking at how we can better assess our impact. So please make sure in that box to be really clear about what the impact is. It's, yeah, the donors wanna see what they can kind of make happen with their money. The last sort of things is about, is it a proven model? So if you have any evidence base or if you've run this sort of program before and you're duplicating it, if, or you're extending and scaling, sorry, if you've, um, you know, if this is coming from the beneficiaries, that this is something that they want. It's really great just to give us that context about why you're submitting this project. And if it is a proven model, it kind of gives us um, that confidence in this project as well. And if it obviously being community led and coming from the people of the beneficiaries is always really positive for us to see. That kind of leads me into the, we look at the sustainability of the project. So we're obviously looking at financial sustainability and also scalability. So um, yeah, Luke kind of mentioned this before, but we're really trying to find those organizations that uh, um, need this sort of extra kick to really help them with the work that they're doing. So we're looking at um, what are your plans for growth? I think is a question in there. So we really want to see where you're kind of looking next, but also at the same time, what is, what's your sustainability? Making sure that we're um, supporting the people, our beneficiaries as best as we can. They were kind of my um, thoughts about how to, um, how to submit a good application. Um, we do try to keep our applications pretty short, so it shouldn't be too tedious, but um, yeah, please do take the time to make sure that it is clear that the project aligned and um, yeah, would work in the pitching format. So I can see a couple of questions coming in. We will get to them. I might just go to Luke to chat, uh, give any other thoughts or a bit of input from white box. I'll then go through the next steps of the process and then we'll um, we will get to those questions. Thanks, Luke. Oh, you're on. Andrew's comment that no one has never worked away with no funds from a TFN and that's probably because of the amazing TFN coaching that's provided. Hey, Ellie. Um, you may have mentioned this before, just to recap it again. How long will the pitch be for? So the pitch is six minutes. No more, no six less. No. Six minutes <laughs> we don't on cut stage. You off, but yeah, we do try and keep it short and sweet. And the pitch coaching is there to help you. Normally we find organizations enter our pitch coaching with about a 20 minute pitch, trying to get to what they say. And our, you know, we have expert pitch coaches that help you dwindle it down to a really engaging six minute pitch. And then the best way to describe it for those that haven't been to an event is a bit like a sort of auction, really. It's like, I'm going to put up a hundred bucks if someone else puts up a hundred bucks and then we sort of call it out. Um, is that fair to say? Yeah, I often describe it almost like a shark tank for nonprofits or social enterprises that you do your pitch and then you're asking for people to invest in you. But it is, um, yeah, the crowdfunding kind of works like that. People put up their hands pledge anywhere from $100 up and then yeah it all kind of accumulates to yeah something really awesome yeah which is which is really cool um so I think just examples of the spend that sort of was coming up there so today I'm applying for $40,000 and that's going to get so just to help people out a bit with little ideas around that 
Um, and I think it's always the ones that I see in the social enterprise stuff that work really well are the ones that sort of have a bit of a stretch goal in there as well. So these are these are just examples and you've got to think of about the ones that are relevant to your business. But it might be, I know that if I spend a dollar on marketing that I'll get three back and then I can get to a point where I can change a thousand lives or I need this piece of equipment and if I can buy this piece of equipment, then I know that I can change another 200 lives or we can change another 200 lives. Um, I know that if we can get $40,000 together, we could hire six months of a BDM um, and that will mean that we'll never need this ever again. So I just need to get to the fixed 40K. But if I could get another 40K, then I could get that BDM to go to, I could hire a comms person or so it will help amplify our message. Or So there's just... Um, Think about the sort of stretch goals within that. Um, yes, yeah, so that's it from me, Ellie. Perfect. Thank you, Luke. Uh, so I'll just chat quickly about the, the next steps. So the applications are obviously due by the 22nd of July, which is a Friday. We leave them open till midnight. Um, we understand, especially now, I feel like every second person is unwell. So we understand that things do happen. So if you do need an extension um, over the weekend, I'm happy to do that if you just get in touch with me first because I do need to reopen the portal. Unfortunately, as I mentioned before, we do have a, a pretty quick turnaround time. So I can try and be as generous as I can, but probably can't offer um, too long extensions. But just if you do need it, please get in touch with me beforehand and we can try and arrange something. So when we get to shortlisting TFN and white box, we're going to work together to cut all the applications down to six. Those six applications, uh, organizations or social enterprises will then be invited to attend the selection panel. So as you would see on the application, the selection panel is on the 10th of August, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so that's an online panel where we have invited representatives from the TFN network, um, representatives from the sector, event uh, partners and intermediaries. and the independent panel are the ones that decide the three social enterprises that go through. So at the panel, you would speak for five minutes about what you do, or you'd pitch basically to a short, or well, three minutes really, a three minute pitch, and then it, we open up to the panel for Q&A, and then they're the ones that decide on the three social enterprises. Um, for, those organ, for those social enterprises that do not make it into the shortlist, we will be in touch with you as soon as we can to let you know. And then we do offer um, feedback as well on your application at that stage. Okay, so that's the next steps. Now we'll um, open it up to questions. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat or if you prefer, um, yeah, you can unmute yourself and we'll just spend the next sort of 10 minutes going through questions and we might give everyone an early mark by the looks of it. So I put questions. Oh, there could be lots of questions. You're right. Okay, let me just have a look if there was any that came through. There's one there from Matt Townsend. Mm -hmm. Is NDIS funding considered as trade income? And yes, I would consider NDIS, you're selling a service to the government and they're paying you in return. So I would consider that as trade income. Perfect. But we'd be looking very carefully at your wider social impact, which you know, I guess would be limited. Were there any other questions? Unless we've been really thorough, maybe. Chris, <laughs> uh, did you say rule out health research as this is a part of what we do? Yeah, unfortunately, we can't fund health research if it's your primary app, um, the primary purpose of your application. If it is a part of what you do, but you also do other work, then that's okay. If you just were able to um, gear your application towards the other work and not have the primary focus being health research. I uh, hope that answered your question, Chris. Uh, Najiba, we are a refugee-led network in Australia. Can we raise funds for the activities in Asia region? Um, so the answer is yes, there needs to be some sort of impact within Australia, but we do recognize this is a world forum. So it's great to kind of bring that global aspect, but part of the criteria is a um, that at least part of your work is kind of supporting 
people in Australia in some sort of way. Um, Najeeva, I'm happy if you want to give me a call after we can talk about what that means. I know that's a little bit vague, but we're just trying to, we are trying to make it broad um, and encompass it, encompass it as a world forum, but we also would like some of the impact to be in Australia, the, that sort of impact we can chat about. So more than happy, I'm sure you've, I think you would have my details if you want to email or call me about that. There's a 50% question there, Ellie. Can I do that one? Yeah, go for it. Um, so what when we say 50%, we're looking for, so let's say you're running a social enterprise. Um, just to be really clear, we're looking for 50, let's say your turnover is a million dollars a year. We're looking for $500,000 of that, William, to come from trade. So $500,000 would be for selling something and $500,000 for grant. It does not mean that your profit has to go back to a community program. Obviously, we want to make sure that you're mission locked and the whole purpose is doing mission work. Um, and so that's going to be the real thing that we're looking for. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Luke. I can see a question here from ACA Fundraising. Uh, if you're not eligible for this event, our next standard TFN event application, I'm actually sorry, we're still working on the calendar, but if you're on our mailing list, you'll be the first to know. So we do have new events coming up all the time. So I can't give you any dates now, but we will, they'll definitely be coming. Um, hey, so we've got the disability environment one. So the environment thing, I think, and Ellie, correct me if I'm wrong, comes back to rulings around um, giving and donations. Is that right? So if you're working in disability and you also impact environment, that's totally cool. You just can't be like 100% environment stuff, which sucks. This is the way our government structured things right now. Hopefully it'll change. But that's is that a fair play, Ellie? Yeah, so it just can't... Uh... Because of our PBI, we can't give to just purely environmental focused projects. So if there is an environmental with a double impact or if it happens to have an environmental impact, then that's fantastic. But it just can't be the sole um, impact from the application. Yeah. Um, I don't know so if anyone knows, but in Australia at the moment, you can't register a nonprofit if you're 100% focused on the environment. It's pretty shit rules. Sorry, <laughs> I know it's recorded. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Um, so there's just been a few that came in. So Stacey said, we're starting up and intend to gain at least 90% of our income from trade, but being first year grant money possible, make up at least 50%. Is that okay? Um, like what do you, um, if you're just starting up and it's, it's, it's a hard one, but unfortunately I think we're kind of looking for organizations that are trading and um, do meet that 50%. We can be a little bit flexible if it's, you know, you're just under 50%. I think we could probably be a bit flexible, Luke. Um, yeah, and we'd be looking for a narrative around that. You know, like sometimes it might be, I got a grant to buy a building um, and that grant was for $900,000 and it knocked out all of it. So, you know, we're going to be reasonable people about this as well and it might be that it's an anomaly event like I know we're, we're building another laundry at the moment and our first year trade might be more grant focused because um, we needed the grant to pay for the laundry equipment um, and so it's going to be more 90 percent than it ever is so just tell us the narrative and we'll yeah if you're close to that 50 percent, then please get in touch with me we can be flexible but we are probably looking for organizations andy's got a question here asking how early is too early if you don't have a proven model yet is this significant um andy it's not significant we um um if you are in startup mode then that's okay i guess if you meet that other criteria around or if you're close to that 50 percent we're, we're really looking for that sweet spot, I would say, Luke, around we don't want any of the behemoths or the really big established social enterprises because we don't think they that this support is, as Luke said, they have other avenues. But we're also looking for those organisations or social enterprises with a couple of runs on the board that are really working already. Um, so we're kind of in that middle. We're not looking for really early, really start and not really big. That sort of sweet spot where what we the funding we can give can really help you take off. But I think also with that, we might have some flexibility. So let's say Ellie puts a pitch in and says, um, you know, experienced entrepreneur, she's had barber shops and done a couple of different things and has sort of got some runs on the board, but has a contract to supply in 10,000 chairs made of bamboo and eucalyptus trees. 
um, obviously ethically harvested. Um, and, and, you know, but she just needs 40 grand to be able to take that to market and got the signed contracts and everything's ready to go. So it's a bit like, you know, we'll be flexible around that. If this is a, if this is something that will change the planet and the communities where you work with, we're going to, you know, we're going to be common sense about it. Exactly. Okay, we've got them coming in fast. I've got one here from Sunny around COVID funding for COVID testing. Um, Sunny, maybe I think we might take that one offline. I think that's pretty specific because uh, it isn't business as usual. That's a bit of a tricky one, but um, we might have a chat about where the other 50% of your income from trade is coming from and we can make a decision around that COVID testing. Hey, we got um, one of those... Um impact in Australia questions there. Okay. Good. So I, I think I think what we're trying to say on that one is, hey, um, if we, you need to have a base in Australia because that's that's the way that we're resourced and funded. But if 90% of what you sell on the impact is in Indonesia, especially if it's in the Pacific or close by, um, then we're definitely um, not going to rule that out. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. And there's just one here. I saw one oh, it just jumped uh, from Fiona. If the organization is a social enterprise, um, but the project uh, is going to need government funding for scale. So if the, the organization is uh, deriving more than 50% from trade, but the project itself needs government funding. Um, in, my, in my opinion, Luke, I think that's okay. I think the I think you are meeting our eligibility as a social enterprise deriving 50% of income. And yeah, that will then be able to, I imagine, be able to support um, the scalability of the project as well. So I yeah. think that's fine, Fiona. There's going to be times where, you know, it's happened to me. It's like I haven't met the, the eligibility criteria as a social enterprise because I got a big government grant or a big grant from somewhere. So we're going to be flexible about that. Mm -hmm. We are, we are humans after all. And um, yeah, but you're, uh, just as you know, your applications don't go through a machine or anything. It's definitely looked at by humans. Um, so, sorry, there's just one from Najiba around auspicing uh, with some donors DGR. If you're an auspiced um, organization, we do accept applications from auspiced organizations as we know it's a way that um, you kind of get off the ground. What we do require is an auspicing letter and we do need to see that to see the ins and outs um, and looking forward, we would need to be able to see the financials of the auspicing organization and preferably of your organization as well. Um, so if you are being auspiced, it's just good to know from the outset. And if you can upload the auspicing letter and we can take it from there, auspicing arrangement. Uh, could I please share my contact? Yes. Audited, audited financial records to show financial capability. So I think obviously we'll ask for audited financial accounts, but if you've had a lot of trade activity in the last, you know, obviously we're in a new financial year or your financial year might be different, then just um, just send us your year-to-date accounts as well. I think that's totally cool to look at. Yeah, so we do ask in the application to upload the uh, most recent financial statement. When we get to the stage where we do a deeper dive, we look at data either on the ACNC, if you're a registered charity, or would be asking you for those statements, um, obviously either reviewed or audited, depending on what you need to be to align with the standards. Um, we also do ask for recent management accounts when we get to the selection panel, and that's just to give us a snapshot about where you currently are. So we'll get to all of that. What are you laughing at, Luke? Is there another one? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> There's heaps of really cool questions here. I'm just going to answer the one that's in front of me. Um, we have almost 50% of our income from selling products. We're going to be like really common sense about this, right? So we are looking for good businesses that are there to make an impact on the world we all live in. Um, and so, and we're going to be looking for those businesses that are selling stuff. And you know, are you going to be able to survive in the future without grants? And how does that look? And is it because sustainability is a core part of this? So that's really what we're what we're looking at there. But if you're at 49 or 48 or even 40, and we're going to like we're looking for good, sustainable businesses that have the opportunity to, you know, should there be one of these in every community we live in? With a bit of help, maybe you can demonstrate that. Yes, I think that's ACA fundraising. Um, Yes, if you're almost 50%, then your annual fundraiser um, 
I guess probably traditionally an annual fundraiser would be more around donations, but if it then, as Luke said, we can be, if you're already up to nearly 50, we can be flexible. Um, I've just popped my email in there. If you want to get in touch, then please do email me or um, my number's also on my signature. So were there any other last minute questions from anyone while we're here? If things do come up, you're more than welcome to email or get in touch. Oh, one more from Joanna, last minute. Uh, and then, oh, there's a couple more, okay. It is so, oh, yeah, so, yeah, you're focused on LGBTQIA+, uh, that's absolutely fine. It's, um, yeah, your project would just be around it, um, demonstrating why the support is needed for that group of beneficiaries. So absolutely, that's fine. Um, for projects, do you need tangible items? No, you don't need tangible items. Um, I'm not sure if I'm understanding you correctly, um, whoever ACA fundraising is, but um, it's more about tangible outcomes really then. So it doesn't need to be selling a particular item. Um, we had an organization at our last social enterprise event called Hotel Edico, and they employ young people with intellectual disabilities um, into running a hotel in the Blue Mountains. You should go stay actually, if you're ever in there. So it's, um, if you have employment outcomes, it doesn't need to be a tangible item. And I think, I think that's everything. Uh, Luke, did you have any final last things? No, just thank you so much. And um, if you haven't bought your ticket for Social Enterprise World Forum yet, Dom, where do you go? How do you get one? <laughs> <laughs> what are the dates <laughs> so last week of september i'll post a link in the chat so it's september 26th to the 29th it's a whole week worth of events um and the main forum itself is the 28th and the 29th of september and this event is on the first night of the there's going to be a ton of different things going on and people you're going to want to meet and we're just squeezing this in after the first day and then you can go and do other stuff as well Exactly. No, it should be an awesome. I'm, I'm really excited for it. So yeah, again, just to reiterate, thank you so much for coming along. Thank you for your interest in this event. If you have any follow-up questions, more than happy for you to get in touch with me. And yeah, really look forward to reading your applications and hearing all about the incredible work you're doing throughout Australia. So thank you for all that you do. Um, thanks for coming along and I hope everyone has a really great day. We can't wait to see you at the World Forum team. Yes. <laughs> thanks everyone. Cheers.